I was uh, hired by the ACLU of Michigan uh, in 2013. I was hired uh, with a specific uh, purpose of investigating and writing about Michigan's emergency manager law, which is a, a law that allows the uh, state to take complete control of financially struggling cities and school districts and, and counties. And as that law has been applied in, in Michigan, uh, the cities and school districts that have been taken over uh, almost exclusively have been a majority African American cities and cities with high poverty rates. Uh, Flint, one of those cities, is 57% uh, uh, African American population and 40% of the people living there live below the, the poverty line. Uh, the reason that this uh, law is of such interest to the ACLU that they would hire somebody to focus on it exclusively as a reporter is that this law takes away democracy. Uh, when these emergency managers are appointed, uh, the elected uh, school boards, city councils, mayors, only have the uh, amount of authority that the emergency manager chooses to allow them to have. Uh, they only get a salary if the emergency manager chooses to give them a salary. And if those uh, elected officials uh, buck the system and uh, don't go along with the program, they get completely marginalized. In one of the towns that was taken over, the emergency managers said, yeah, the city council can meet. This is, this is what they can do. They can call the meeting to order. They can read the minutes of the previous meeting, and they can adjourn the meeting. That's it. And uh, that's the extent of the power that uh, these emergency managers have. They can uh, create new ordinances they, by fiat, just say, this is going to be a law. They can abolish existing ordinances. They can take away the health care benefits of retirees. They can sell off city assets. They can void collective bargaining agreements and, and break contracts. The law, there's only one thing that the law says that they cannot do, which is miss a bond payment, which I think really gets to the, the heart of what's going on here, uh, which is that it is to ensure that the, the banks get get paid no matter what the cost. And for Flint, Michigan, the cost was the, the poisoning of a, a city's water supply. Uh, we're going to start tonight by showing a, a very short uh, seven-minute mini-documentary that we made. Uh, it was released just about a year ago. And it was really right before uh, the whole lead problem with uh, Flint's water uh, began to be exposed. And it, it's sort of, uh, I like to show it because it, it lays the foundation of what was going on in Flint uh, prior to really digging in and, and exposing the, the lead problem. So I think with that we're going to, uh, to show this uh, video. It's called uh, Hard to Swallow. And the, the reason that we called that at that was that uh, two things. One was that the water itself was hard to swallow, uh, that the decision was made by one of these emergency managers unilaterally decided that in an attempt to help balance Flint's budget, they were going to get off the uh, Detroit system, which had been providing clean, safe water for 50 years, and use the Flint River as its water source, which uh, around Flint's known as uh, GM Sewer. Uh, Flint is the, the birthplace of uh, General Motors. Uh, the other thing that was hard to swallow along with the, the water was the uh, claims by the city and, and state that the water was safe to drink. Uh, the people knew it was not safe, and they, so they didn't swallow the lie uh, that it was safe, and they, they fought relentlessly to get the truth out. And so with that, well, here's a hard to swallow. In 2001, the first of four emergency managers took total control of Flint, a city of 100,000 people located about 70 miles northwest of Detroit. The emergency managers were in charge of all aspects of local government. Including Flint's water system. 
We knew that this emergency manager law was undemocratic. We knew it was unprecedented, but we never dreamed that we would be faced with not being able to use our municipal water. On April 25th, 2014, in his third year under emergency management, Flint's water source was changed. Three, two, one. With the push of a button, the water valve from Detroit was shut off, and the city of Flint's main source of water is now the Flint River. When we heard it on the news that we might be drinking Flint water, might be going to that, we all thought it was a joke. Because everybody knows how gross the Flint River is. I think there was a Guinness Book of World Records broken for how many shopping carts were in one body of water. Here's the Flint. Here's the Flint. Here it is. And then, when, and then when, of course, the snow thawed, there was two bodies found in it. Some residents are wondering, will we see a change? Average resident won't notice any difference. Right. My water's been brown since the switch. The work that has gone into preparing the city of Flint to uh, eliminate its dependence on Detroit Water and Sewer Department, that's a major step, a huge step in the right direction because it now gives you the opportunity to control, better control the cost. Water bills have continued to rise since the switch to nearly $150 per month for the average household. Who pays the highest price in Genesee County for water? We do. You have older women and older men out here and they, they're trying to survive just off of their pensions. There's no relief for your bills, you're gonna get shut off and then everybody knows. You lose your water for 90 days, they cap your sewer, condemn your home, take your children. On one side was the city of Flint's finances, and on the other side was the health of the citizens of Flint. We've had three or four boil water advisories. The rashes, the hair loss, the muscle stiffness, the soreness. My family broke out in a rash that we were told looks like scabies, but it wasn't scabies. For instance, right now, we don't baptize. If we baptize, we have to go outside of the city of Flint. In May, August, and November 2014, Flint failed state water tests that found dangerously high levels of carcinogenic chlorine byproducts called total trihalomethanes. The city was legally, wasn't legally required to inform citizens of these results until January 2015, nine months after the TTH problem was first detected. The minute we failed that first test, we should have known. We ran into some bumps, but what did we do when that happened? Tell us Didn't tell us. January. You waited. January. January. What did we do about that? Seven months. We started immediately to address the problem. Without telling the public. We are telling you now. And when you get to the point where you feel like it don't matter what I say or do, they're going to do what they want to do anyway, that's a sad day for America. City officials say that Flint's water now meets TTHM standards, but residents still report brown, cloudy, or foul-smelling water. Flint residents have nothing to worry about. Those levels are back to normal. If you don't believe that particular test, that, that's your prerogative. This is a democracy. How is this democracy? Well, it's as much as we're, we have for now. Not trusting local authorities, residents saw analysis from Bob Bocock, a water expert who works closely with consumer advocate Aaron Brockovich. Now we've done research, and that's what's on our website. Link after link, after study, after result. We have an old infrastructure. When you change your source water, you disrupt the biofilm that's already built up in those pipes. The pipes are eating themselves from the inside out. After consulting experts, residents sought medical tests and other health problems came to light. Come to find out I have hemolytic anemia, which now we find is caused by copper toxicity. In April, beginning of April, we found out my child had lead poisoning and that's when the city came out and shut my water off. 
on Detroit, we didn't have these issues. Put us back on Detroit until you can figure out what you're doing and prove to us beyond a doubt that this water is clean and safe. This Detroit water, can we hook up again to the Detroit water? Great question. Everybody's asking, can we hook up? We can if we have a money tree. You'd be sorry if we hooked up on that, so that's the answer to that question. Do you live in Flint? You are literally in a fight for your life right now. I'm terrified of what, you know, the outcome of this, the aftermath of this could be neurologically for my children. We are being saddled with this toxic water because we under a toxic system under emergency management. Sir, you're killing us, sir. Please. I'm not killing please. anybody. Sir, we feel like we live in a third world country. We're getting poisoned water and we have no rights. In May 2015, Michigan Governor Rick Snyder declared Flint's financial emergency to be over. The city's fourth emergency manager vacated his position with one final order. Flint officials may not revise any of his previous orders for at least a year. So, so that was the situation one year ago. Uh, it might even be the one year anniversary of when we released that uh, video. And I uh, show it for a couple reasons. There, I think there's some very telling things in, in that uh, you know, short piece. Uh, one of which is the attitude of those emergency managers toward uh, people that they're supposed to be serving. Uh, the meeting where the emergency manager was being questioned about why they didn't tell the people uh, about the TTHM problem uh, was the first meeting that I went to uh, to start to cover the issue of what was going on with Flint's water. And when he said, uh, you know, in response to why didn't you tell us, and he just said, well, I'm telling you now, it was such a cold, callous uh, attitude towards people. The, you know, no elected official would ever talk to his constituents that way because they would not be an elected official very long. But that emergency manager didn't really care what the people of Flint thought. Uh, they didn't have any uh, say in, in what he did. He was there because he was appointed by the governor and given uh, complete uh, control. Uh, one thing that the, this documentary does not say, uh, the river, they switched to the river, was made in April of 2014. In October of 2014, the General Motors uh, plant in Flint uh, that made engines uh, complained that the water was corroding the engine parts before they even made it out of the plant. And so they went to the, the emergency manager and got special permission to return to the Detroit system uh, because the engine parts were being corroded. But yet when the City Council in March of 2015 voted to return to the Detroit system. The emergency manager said no, uh, like the fellow in the documentary said. If you had a money tree, we could do it, but you don't have a money tree, so that's that. So essentially, shut up and keep drinking this poisoned water. Uh, so I think that this does a good job of, of just showing the, the cold, callous disregard uh, that these emergency managers have for the people that they're supposed to be serving. And like the one person uh, you, you heard in the video, they yelled out, do you live in Flint? Well, no, they didn't live in Flint. You know, they are like hired guns uh, brought in to uh, try to clean up these uh, financial uh, problems uh, and, and doing anything necessary to make sure that the bondholders always got paid. The other thing that is very, very instructive uh, the, the one mom, Leanne Walters, uh, featured in this, uh, the one explaining what was going on with the pipes. So that, that uh, interview was filmed in April of 2015. So at that point, she was clearly explaining what was going on, that the water was too corrosive and it was basically chewing apart the pipes. Because what happened was that for 50 years, uh, they were getting clean, safe, treated water from Flint, or from Detroit system. They switched to the river. When they switched to the river, uh, the decision was made not to use mandatory corrosion control because it would have cost too much to 
bring in the equipment needed to put that uh, phosphates or what they use, which creates kind of coating in the pipes and that keeps the lead particles from leaching into the water. And so she had been talking with people in the water plant. They told her that the corrosion control was not being used. And so here you have a mom, a stay-at-home mom, that in April of 2015 was saying exactly what it was that caused her child to be lead poisoned. The people who are trained scientists, supposed experts in this issue, were at the same time and for months and months and months after that claiming that the water was safe. Uh, we put out this video. Uh, right around the same time the video came out, there was a water specialist for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency named Miguel Del Toro, who's really the uh, unsung hero in, in this story. Uh, Leanne Walters, the mom, after finding out that her uh, child had been lead poisoned, searched and searched and searched at all levels of government, finding somebody that actually cared enough to, to do their job and to protect the health and well-being of, of people. And Del Toro uh, took a personal interest in, in the case. He uh, hooked Leanne up with a, a scientist at Virginia Tech University, a guy named Mark Edwards, who is uh, the, the guy that discovered a lead in Washington, D.C.'s water in the early 2000s, uh, a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient, one of the, the foremost experts on uh, this issue in, in the country. Uh, Edwards sent uh, sample kits to Leanne. They tested her water and they found, they took like 30 samples. One of the samples had lead levels of 13,200 parts per billion. Uh, so to put that in perspective, to start off, really uh, zero levels of lead is the only safe levels. There, there's, there's really no safe levels of lead, especially uh, to young children. Uh, you know, for kids, you know, lead is a very, very powerful neurotoxin. Uh, you know, for young kids whose brains are still developing, it causes them to have a lower IQ. It uh, causes learning disabilities and behavioral problems. Uh, for pregnant women, it can cause miscarriages, so it's, it's just incredibly uh, damaging neurotoxin. Uh, so there's zero safe levels. The federal action level is 15 parts per billion. If you have 15 parts per billion of lead in your water, remedial action needs to be taken. At 5,000 parts per billion, lead in water is considered hazardous waste. So they found out that going into their house was water containing more than two and a half times the levels of lead that it takes to be classified as hazardous waste. They found this out. Miguel del Toro wrote a, a memo saying that he, he found out initially when he asked the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality about the corrosion control, they lied and said that they had a corrosion uh, control program in place when they didn't. They weren't using the mandatory corrosion control. He, he found that out, actually Leanne found that out talking to someone from the water department. She told Miguel, Miguel followed up. Initially they lied, eventually he was able to verify that it was not being used. Uh, he looked at the science and said, okay, there are unbelievable levels of lead in this one family's home, but based on the science, uh, this isn't an isolated issue. Anybody that has a lead service line bringing water into their house is likely to have a, a severe problem with lead in their water. Uh, he wrote an uh, internal memo, but being a longtime EPA employee, he was concerned that the memo would get watered down and buried in the bureaucracy, so he gave a copy of it to Leanne because he saw this as a, a potential public health crisis and felt a real urgency to get the word out. So he gave a copy of that memo to Leanne, knowing that Leanne was not going to sit on it. Because we had just done this documentary, taken seriously the concerns and, and frustrations uh, and problems being expressed by the people of Flint, uh, Leanne gave that memo to me. And we, we published it, and we wrote a story about it. I 
talked to Miguel, I talked to Mark Edwards who explained the science. Uh, I tried to talk to the state, they refused to answer my questions. Uh, subsequent emails show that they they were talking about, you know, this guy from the, the ACLU that kept calling, wanting want to ask questions about what was going on. Uh, he identifies himself as a reporter, and they put the word reporter in quotes. They, they didn't consider me a legitimate reporter, and they didn't consider it, you know, worthwhile to answer my questions. Um, in the long run, it did him absolutely uh, zero good not to answer my questions. As a matter of fact, the uh, people who didn't answer my questions were among those who ended up uh, resigning in disgrace. But uh, at the point, uh, Michigan Radio, which did an incredible job, they, they read my story, they saw the memo, they came in and talked to me because uh, I'm hired as a reporter, but one of my job functions is also to assist other reporters. So I spent a couple hours with the person, a reporter from Michigan Radio, explaining exactly what was going on, explaining everything that I had learned from Mark Edwards and Miguel Del Toro. They followed up about it. They contacted the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality and the, the spokesman, a guy named Brad Werfel, a uh, very smug guy, with always had a kind of a smirk on his face, uh, said that when it comes to lead in Flint's water, there, there's no problem. Uh, we have been testing throughout the city and there's no widespread problem. So the people of Flint can just relax. That was his word, relax. Even though, keep in mind, months earlier, this was by this time it was July of 2015. In April, Leanne Walters is sitting there saying exactly what's going on, saying why it's a problem. The water is too corrosive. It's chewing these pipes apart. The biofilm that's keeping lead from leaching into the water has been destroyed. We're getting lead poisoned. The experts say, just relax, no problem. They said Miguel Del Toro was a rogue employee. That memo was not vetted. It didn't go through the proper channels. Uh, you know, he's, he's just this rogue employee that improperly released this memo. You don't pay any attention to it. So at that point, it was a, a he said, she said sort of story, which, you know, as a journalist, I hate those kinds of stories because it's like, who are you going to believe, right? Well, the state's saying it's safe, and you just got this one guy out there saying it's a problem. Who are you going to believe? And so the answer to that was to, we came up with the idea, we're going to do our own tests. Uh, Mark Edwards applied to the National Science Foundation and got an emergency grant, sent uh, 300 sample kits to Flint. And uh, I was working with Edwards, I was working with a, a group of residents, mostly the people in that video, the, the minister and the moms and the... Uh, Claire McClinton, the woman that's talking about uh, toxic water under a toxic uh, system. Uh, I called them all of them up. I said, look, we want to do our own tests. Will you help, uh, help organize it? Will you help doing it? Absolutely. So a group of about six or seven of us started uh, calling people into, putting out notices, holding public meetings, uh, telling people what we wanted to do and why we wanted to do it, but basically said we want to, we would just want to find out what's really going on with the water. Matter of fact, at one point, we're in the basement of a, a church in Flint called the Church of God, uh, which is in a neighborhood that's surrounded by vacant houses. You know, Flint used to have a population of 200,000. Uh, when GM started closing plants, the tax base eroded, and the people left. It's, it's now 100,000 people, and that's one of the parts of its, its problem. It just has an infrastructure for a city of 200,000 people, and just 100,000 people, 40% of whom live in, in poverty, to try to support it. So it's just a poor, poor city. It's not, it's not that they're mismanagement or they don't know how to run government. It's just that they're put in a really almost impossible situations, which is why the emergency managers can't solve the problem. It's not a managerial problem, it's a structural problem. Uh, we're in the basement of the church, I'm filming for documentaries we're making, and there's an a activist named Naira Sharif who was there, and I was surrounded by all these boxes, and I said, Naira, what's going on? She's there. We have these sample kits and we're gonna get them out to the people. 
and we're going to find out the truth about what's in our water. And, th and that's what our mission was. Our mission was not to do anything more than to get to the truth about what was in the Flint's water because we didn't believe what the government was saying. We distributed the kits. We did everything we could to make sure that we didn't leave any openings because we knew that the, the state and the city were going to come after us and attack us for what we found. And so we took all sorts of precautions to ensure that we were bulletproof because we knew that they were going to come gunning for us. And we distributed 200 of the kits. And when we did that, we sat down because they all took really good notes. We had all these note cards with the names and addresses and contact information of the, who got the kits and also who handed them out and who collected them. We sat there at 200 and put on map where all the samples had been distributed to and then went out knocking on doors in neighborhoods that we hadn't hit in order to make sure that we had a wide, uh, even distribution as possible throughout the, the city so they could not claim that we were cherry picking and, and just going and looking in neighborhoods where we knew that there was a problem. Even though that the law requires that the state and city test high risk homes, homes that have either a lead service line or lead plumbing because the whole purpose of the law is to go looking for lead where they know lead exists in order to make sure that the corrosion control is working. So we were doing the best we could to make sure that everybody was being uh, tested all throughout the city. Meanwhile, while that's going on, I began conducting a parallel investigation to look into how the city and state were conducting their tests. And through filing Freedom of Information Act requests, I was able to prove that instead of focusing on high-risk homes, the, the city, after receiving a warning from the state, being told that so many of their samples were coming in with lead levels above the action level, that the, they better hope that no more come in uh, that are high, and the next 30 tests that they conducted all came in below the action level, which according to Mark Edwards, if you're doing legitimate tests, the odds of that happening are almost impossible. And the reason it happened is because I was able to prove that they were focusing their testing on areas of the city that they knew was gonna produce low results. So they were cheating, and they were cheating in a, in a lot of ways in order to make it appear that the water was meeting federal standards. And then they were using those tests that they cheated on to assure people that their water was safe. We did our tests. We found that the levels of lead were much higher than what the city and state were claiming and much higher than what the, the federal action level was. The response of the state, just like they attacked Miguel del Toro, they started attacking the credibility of Mark Edwards, a guy that's, that's impeccable ethics, uh, you know, one of the best guys that you could ever meet, a gutsy guy, but absolutely ethical. Uh, the Brad Werfel again sent an email to a reporter saying, talking about Edwards and his team, uh, these people have a habit of pulling this rabbit out of this hat wherever they go, basically saying that they were falsely uh, creating high, high lead results in order to somehow gain from it. When the truth was just the opposite, that they weren't the ones that were cheating, it was the government agencies that were, were cheating. Uh, but they, again, throughout this whole thing, the, the MO of the, the state was to deny there was a problem and attack the credibility of the people who were trying to tell the truth. And that's not just my opinion. Um, eventually, the governor was forced to appoint a task force to look into the, the whole source of the crisis. And his own task force said, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality throughout this crisis has spent its time and energy attacking the credibility of people who were eventually proven to be telling the truth rather than actually doing their job, which is to protect the health and well-being of the people of Flint. We held a press conference September 15 uh, on the front lawn of the Flint City Hall. Mark Edwards got up there and said, this is what we found in terms of lead. This is why it's happening. They're not using corrosion control. Uh, the Flint River's highly corrosive. Anybody that looked at this for five minutes 
uh, could have predicted this would be the, re the results by using this highly corrosive water without having corrosion control. Uh, I got up at the press conference and said, I've been investigating this, and how do you explain the fact that the Virginia Tech has found these levels and the city has found these levels. Well, here's how you can explain it. The city cheated on its test and there needs to be an outside investigation into to what happened here. September 15, the state replies, our tests are good, we're not finding the same results. The water is safe. One of the persons that listened to what we were saying was a doctor a pediatrician at a Hurley Medical Center, a hospital in Flint, a woman named Mona Hanna Atisha. She decided that she was going to look at uh, lead blood levels of children under the age of five. She looked at a nine month period before the switch, nine month period after the switch. What she found was that after the switch, the percentage of kids with elevated levels of lead in their blood doubled. In parts of the city where our testing found the highest levels of lead in the water, the kids with elevated levels of lead in their blood tripled. So she essentially collaborated, corroborated what we found, helped prove the legitimacy of our tests. Even with that, the state spokeswoman for the governor said she spliced and diced her data. Uh, she's unnecessarily fanning the hysteria. The, at this point, because the, the media was pretty slow, the mainstream media was pretty slow to pick up on this, uh, but at that point, the Detroit Free Press, the major daily in Detroit, uh, asked the state for its data. Their, their data person analyzed it and said, guess what, your own data verifies what Mona Hanna Tisha has just reported. It, the switch to the river did lead to a significant increase in the lead blood levels in, in children. And at that point, it was pretty much game over. They couldn't deny it anymore, although they, at the, they did try to, for a little while longer, say, oh, the problem isn't using the river, it's just this old infrastructure. Uh, but it was so obviously blatantly not true because Mona Hanna Atisha had showed that it was not until after the switch to the river that the lead was unleashed into the system. Uh, it was clearly due to the river and the fact that they were not using the mandatory corrosion control. So the governor held a press conference and said, okay, we're gonna let Flint return to the Detroit system. He also said at that press conference, I, you know, there's no reason to point any fingers of blame here. You know, uh, his, his motto is relentless positive action. Uh, and so we might conduct an after action report just to see if there's any problems to make sure it doesn't happen again. But really there's, there's no, no reason to assign blame. Uh, but the public outcry was so great that he was forced to appoint a, a panel who investigated it and you know his own panel, right? His own people that he chose to conduct this investigation. They're the ones that uh, said that the MDEQ was spending all its energy trying to discredit people telling the truth. And that same panel also said at the heart of this crisis is the state's emergency manager law. And the fact that democracy was taken away from people is what led to this crisis because elected officials would have not made the choice to use that river. You know, this was someone that was no connection with the city, no responsibility to the residents of the city made this decision. You know, one of the things that the um, public officials kept claiming was that they didn't have any choice, that Detroit canceled a long-term contract, which was true and that Detroit kicked them off of the system so they had to use the river. That's a lie. I was able to prove that was a lie too by getting a uh, letter through Freedom of Information Act request where one of the emergency managers, the Detroit wanted to keep selling water to Flint. Uh, a decision had been made to build a new pipeline and when that decision was made, Detroit did cancel this long-term contract, but in the interim, while the pipeline was being built, Detroit wanted to keep 
selling water, the emergency manager said, thanks, but no thanks. We're going to use the river because it's, it's a cheaper option. And sure, it's, it's dirty, but you know, it's, it's like it's only going to be a couple years. And when you look at the emails, and as the crisis uh, really became apparent, you can tell that the whole thinking on the part of the state was, we just got to ride this out. We just got to make it past these two years, and then this problem will be behind us, and everyone will forget about it, and no one will ever know. Uh, but through the combined efforts of these residents and the, and the people that uh, stepped up to the plate, people like Mark Edwards and Mona Hanna Atisha and Miguel Del Toro, uh, the, the truth was exposed. And now people are being held accountable. Uh, you know, the governor who said there's no reason to uh, fix blame uh, has been under a tremendous amount of, of uh, fire. Uh, three officials, one who works for the city and two who work for the state, have been charged with criminal felony charges. One of them has struck a plea deal and has agreed to cooperate. Uh, the U.S. Attorney uh, Justice Department is conducting criminal investigation. The FBI is conducting criminal investigation. The criminal investigation unit of the U.S. EPA is investigating. The state attorney general is investigating. And the Genesee County prosecutor, where Flynn is located, is doing a criminal investigation. Uh, three people have been charged. Also, just this week, civil suit has been filed against three of the engineering firms that were involved in the switchover. Uh, they've been hit with a, a civil suit that could end up in uh, penalties of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for their role in the crisis. So there is a, a lot of blame is now being affixed, and it's by no means over. The state attorney general says with certainty that more criminal charges are, are coming. And so the story is, is far from over. Uh, we made a, a, a full-length documentary, a 45-minute documentary, and one of the people in it is, is Claire McClinton, who, I love Claire, you know, she's, she's just like, no BS, right? Claire just lays it out. And uh, we concluded that uh, second documentary, which is called Here's to Flint, after the, the scene in, in this where all those officials are raising up their glasses of water saying here's to Flint when they did the switch over. Uh, the person I made the film with, uh, Kate Levy, who's a very talented filmmaker, has a, a pretty ironic outlook on life, and so she was pretty adamant that you know we had to call our our documentary "Here's to Flint." Uh, we conclude that documentary with Claire saying, "Stay tuned. This story is not over yet. They poisoned the wrong town, and they did poison the wrong town." Uh, the people of Flint uh, are incredibly resilient. Uh, but it's also tragic. I think that uh, the water's still not safe. It's more than two years. They've been poisoned. They've been lied to. Their property values have been devastated. I mean, try selling a house in Flint. Who's going to buy a house in a town where the water's poisoned, right? Uh, they've gone through all sorts of financial hardship. They've gone through having to live on bottled water. You know, try, try you know, existing on, on bottled water. It's, you know, impossible to do in a way, and all the guilt of, of you know, knowing that your kids are gonna be damaged. I mean, the damage of lead is irreversible. These kids are harmed for their, their lives. And they're suffering kind of post-traumatic stress there, uh, having gone through all this. It's you know, incredibly tragic, tragic really beyond words. And it's still going on. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to talk about good things having come from a tragedy like that. But, you know, the EPA was on the verge of relaxing its lead testing rules. As a result of Flint, there's been a 180 degree change. And now are looking at tightening them up. And the, uh, as Essex said in the introduction, it's, it's now on the radar all over the country. People are asking questions and, and paying close attention to what's going on with their water. And they're finding lead in a lot of the water of a lot of schools they're testing. So, you know, Mark Edwards told me at one point, the, the biggest 
concern is not having lead in your water. The biggest concern is having lead in your water and not knowing about it. And when we held our press conference on September 15th and told the people of Flint, your water's not safe, that was a major milestone and a major victory because really from that point on, the people knew that there was lead in their water and it was not safe. And so from that point on, the poisoning of, of people was uh, stopped. And now throughout the country, uh, poisoning is, is being stopped. So in that way, it's, it's, it's a very heartening story. But it's also a heartening story in that this happened because the people of Flint were relentless. Like, Nairia said in the basement of that church last summer, we're just here to find out the truth about what's in our water. And that's one of the bottom line lessons that I hope people take away from this, which is the importance of the tr truth. And you know, that's why I'm an investigative reporter, that's what my job is, is to try to help uncover and expose the truth. And that's what the people of Flint wanted to do, which was to uncover and expose the truth. And, the, one of the takeaway lessons from Flint is what an incredibly powerful thing that the truth is. And so I think at, at that we can uh, move to the, the question and answer part of the, of the tonight's program. But thank you very much. First thing, let me, let me take you back a bit because we've all focused on the Flint water story. Many of us when the national media finally got on the story, I've had a chance to see it. But finding the Flint water story wasn't what you were really after, right? My, my, no, when I, when I started my job, the last thing in the world I imagined would be that I would be writing about the lead contamination of a city's water supply. Uh, my job was to investigate and write about what was happening with the emergency manager law and what were the, the consequences of this law and what happens when you take democracy away from the people. Uh, when I first started talking to Flint, one of the major concerns was the, the cost of their water. Uh, you know, you saw 150 bucks a month for a family of four. And you have to remember, Flint is in the heart of the Great Lakes. You know, the Great Lakes contain 20% of the world's fresh surface water. The largest supply of fresh surface water in the world is the Great Lakes. Flint's in the heart of it, yet people could not afford to drink it because the problem is this aging infrastructure and having a poor population, uh, a depleted population that cannot afford to maintain it. And so, you know, all these issues were, were swirling around, but, but you're right, when I first started writing about this, it was not set out to, to write about the problem with Flint, the lead in the water, but that's where the story took me. That's, I mean, that's what yeah. journalists do, right? You sort of get on the trail, and then you keep following the trail, and, and, that's, where, and that's where the trail led me, was to write about the, this lead issue. The, your reporting clearly uncovered that there was a very deliberate cover-up. When they made the switch, did they know in advance the minute they made the switch that they were gonna be endangering people or is that something that was just a mistake on their part that they did not feel they could correct? No, they, they might not, I haven't seen anything that indicated concerns about lead in the water but there were red flags about using the river and they knew how difficult it was gonna to be to treat. And so they warned about the problems of bacterial contamination beforehand, uh, which proved to be prescient in, because of the E. coli problems. And they also knew that there was a high likelihood because of that, then there would also be problems associated with over-chlorinating the water in order to deal with the bacterial problems, which is what caused the TTHM uh, problem. So that was people within the MDEQ, a few of them, raised that warning and advised against using the, the Flint River uh, because of that. They, they knew that there was 
definitely the possibility that there were going to be significant problems with using the river. Also, the head of the water treatment plant, two, two weeks before the switchover, wrote an email to the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality saying, we are not prepared. They were understaffed. The staff was not uh, adequately trained. He said, if you go ahead with the switchover in two weeks, it's going to be over my objections because we are not prepared to do it. But because they were in such a rush to start saving that money, they went ahead anyhow. And so, you know, did they know that they were going to lead poison people? Uh, that hasn't been proved yet. Did they know that the plant was not ready to do the job? Yes. Did they know that there was a high likelihood that there was going to be a lot of problems associated with using the river? Yes. Did they decide to go ahead anyhow because it was more important for them to save money? Yes. Interesting that they were cavalier about the bacterial contamination. You know, they, they may not have known about the lead contamination, but dangerous bacteria, that seemed to be fine with them. You know, another problem, we didn't get into this and I didn't talk about it, was Legionnaire's disease. Uh, Twelve people have died uh, from Legionnaire's disease. and. That's a problem as well, partly because, you know, they used to have all this industry in Flint that's no longer there. So they have all these oversized uh, water delivery systems and which sits there for long periods of time. And while it's sitting there, the chlorine dissipates. And when the chlorine dissipates, that allows for more bacterial uh, contamination. And there was an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease that the state was aware of that, that they never disclosed. Uh, in the long documentary, there's this really sort of heartrending uh, scene where this woman, a mom, is asking Mark Edwards, because uh, along with sending the sample kits, Mark uh, loaded up a, a van full of uh, students uh, from Virginia Tech and drove up to, to Flint to do on-site testing. And he's going from house to house to house. He's not finding any chlorine in the water because part of what they did was they cut back on the use of chlorine in order to deal with the TTHM problem. Uh, and the, the, the mom goes, what about uh, Legionnaire's disease? Uh, is, is that a, possible? Uh, Legionnaire's disease, for those of you who, who don't know, it is uh, very much like pneumonia. And, you know, the mom goes, you know, because all four of my kids this summer had pneumonia. And at the hospital they said, you know, kids getting pneumonia in the summertime, that's, that's pretty much unheard of. Is, is Legionnaire's disease a, a possibility? And, and Mark said, yeah. And then it turned out that there was, the health department knew that there was a, a significant outbreak of, of Legionnaires and, and never informed the public about it. Let's get to some of your questions and uh, a couple of the first uh, questions have to do with this emergency management law. Uh, how has it continued to be used? Has the emergency management law been challenged? Under what authority is it enforced? Any changes to the policy? Uh, there is a challenge. The ACLU of Michigan is co-counsel in a, a federal lawsuit that's challenging the constitutionality of, of this law uh, that takes away democracy from people. But it's, um, it's, a difficult, uh, it's a difficult case because the state, essentially cities and school districts are creatures of the state. And, and so really the state could say, uh, this city no longer exists. They can, can abolish it. But, but if they were to do that, you know, those people would end up in another jurisdiction where they would have a right to elected representation. Uh, what they're doing is the city continues to exist, but they're taking away democracy. And so there's, there's good hope that uh, eventually that they will be prevailed. But the state's fighting them tooth and nail uh, to protect this law. Uh, as a result of what happened in Flint, there's some uh, discussion in the legislature about modifying it, making it less onerous, but, uh, you know, it is, uh, you know, we're a nonpartisan organization, but the, just the fact is that the 
legislature is controlled uh, by conservatives who are very much supportive of this law. And so that's an uphill battle. So as it stands now, the law remains in, in place and there is really very little that can be done in terms of stopping it. Uh, right now, it's, it's, it's rolling on. And, you know, one of the things that, the way this law has been applied is that almost with, the, I think, one or two exceptions, every city and school district that's been taken over by the state are majority African American and high poverty rates. So this is very much a racial issue and very much a, a, a class issue. Can you expand on that? Because that's one of our questions here. What role do you believe race played here? Well, I mean, it's just on its face. It, it is being applied to cities that are majority African American. Uh, they're we're in the midst of, of doing a study right now, and there is evidence that there were other cities that were majority white cities that met the criteria that they could have been taken over, they, they, but they weren't. So that's, that's one way that race plays a role. And here's, a, here's another way, and it's, you know, talking about race is, you know, sensitive thing, and especially for a white person to be uh, talking about race, but I, I can tell you that one of the, the reasons that this law has been able to go the way it has is that there are a lot of people that live in the suburbs of uh, Detroit that are racist. And they have, the, the mindset is, and I'm sorry if this is offensive, but the, the mindset is those people, those people can't handle their own business, right? They're either inept or, or corrupt. And so they justify in their mind having the state come in and take it over because of their racism that they believe that people of color uh, are not capable of self-government. And, that, and that's a very difficult thing to say, but I think that that is, in my experience, uh, absolutely true, unfortunately. What, if any, progress has been made in retrofitting the Flint water system, replacing the damaged lead service lines from the street to the houses? Almost zero at this point. So uh, what are people doing? They are e either using filtered water or drinking bottled water. And if you are a parent of young children or the um, pregnant, you're being instructed to just use bottled water uh, although there just a, a study was done uh, that showed that filtered water is, is safe to use, but the water itself is still not in compliance with uh, federal regulations. It's still, lead levels are, are still too high. So, uh, you know, people are continuing to have to, even though they're paying these ex extraordinary costs for this water, they're, it's still not safe to drink. So just to be clear, people uh, have to buy bottled water, and they still have to pay their water bills. Yes, yes, yes. Although, if, so when the governor was, uh, con Congress held hearings on this, and the governor said, well, people are going to get rebated a uh, certain percentage of their water bills uh, because, you know, we poisoned them for two years, and so... <laughs> Uh, so what we did was uh, we calculated out like how much water is actually used for cooking and how much water is used for drinking as opposed to how much water is used for showering and how much water is used when you flush the toilet. So, you know, we think that uh, based on all that and, you know, with a little leeway that people should be rebated 67%. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, Jesus, if, if they would have put half the effort into actually making sure the water was safe as they put into like calculating down to the percentage point how much water is used when you flush your toilet and decide that you're going to charge people for, for that water, you know, that the city would have been much, much better off. That was one of the most, you know, more ludicrous parts of, of, of this whole story. 
Another question here. Can you sell your house in Flint currently? Is there a plan to help with the property values or to assist residents in relocating due to the crisis? Uh, property values have been devastated. Like, like I said, who wants to buy a house in a city where the water is poisoned? You know, it, and Flint was already, uh, like Detroit, uh, when the uh, things crashed as a result of the uh, predatory lending. You know, predatory lending uh, focused on communities of color. They, they targeted low-income communities uh, of color to, to sell them these predatory loans that, you know, start off with low interest rates. They would, you know, they would go to elderly people. Uh, you know, there's a high rate of illiteracy in uh, cities like uh, Flint. So they would go to people and say, who had their houses paid off and said, you know, you can take out a, a new mortgage on your house because you need a, a new roof. And so you can get the, the $10,000 or $15,000 that you need to put a roof on your house. And, and you know, you're only going to have to pay this much a month. Well, yeah, initially, but then they would be hit with these balloon payments that, you know, these are largely people on fixed income, disability, Social Security, things like that, that they were being really uh, snookered into taking out these loans that the lenders knew that they were not going to be able to meet once the uh, balloon uh, payments hit. And then their houses would get re repossessed, uh, which was fine as long as there was not too many of those houses. But once everything crashed as a result of the artificial bubble that was created, because the other thing that they were doing there was corruption all the way along the line. They were doing uh, false appraisals of houses, you know, the uh, don't ask, don't tell in terms of uh, income. So they were giving loans to uh, people that could not afford it and then bundling it and dicing it up and selling them as, uh, you know, safe securities, which, you know, led to the, the whole financial collapse. Uh, so these low income, uh, high minority communities were, were just devastated and uh, housing values were devastated. You know, a lot of parts of the country, even a lot of parts of Michigan, things are back to pretty much where they were before the crash. But in Detroit, there are still a lot of houses that are $10,000 houses in, in neighborhoods with lots of vacant houses. And uh, it's the same way in Flint, but as bad as they were before, they're even worse now because people literally cannot cannot sell their houses and there and there is no at this point no compensation for those people there's class action lawsuits that uh, have will have the goal of, of trying to compensate them for that or for you know all the plumbing that was destroyed all the water heaters that were destroyed because of this corrosive water you know all the dishwashers and washing machines and ice makers and washing machines. It's interesting I, that you bring up the, the, the machinery because I, I hadn't really thought of that. This destroys your water heater. I've replaced a couple. They're expensive. Yes. This destroys your washing machine. How hard is it to live without a washing machine? Right. Yeah. Ruins the plumbing in your house, just like it was chewing up the, the, the pipes of the, the city's infrastructure. It's chewing up the pipes in, in people's homes because it was so highly corrosive. It was you know, five times more corrosive than the, the water that they were getting from Detroit. And for some reason, uh, the uh, leaded, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the, on the word, but when they do the joints, when they solder, the leaded solder, it's even more corrosive. It's like 19 times more corrosive. And so it would like absolutely tear apart those joints. And so, you know, all, all kinds of incredible damage was done to the internal plumbing couple in of people's homes. And so you have a situation where you have a home that's worth $10,000 and it might cost $15,000 to replace all the plumbing in the home. What, what do you do in a situation like that? It's, it's, it's really unbelievably difficult situation to address. A couple of related questions here. Have any of the managers been indicted? And what's the status of the governor? Why hasn't he been arrested? <laughs> the uh, people who have been charged so far are lower level, mid-level people. 
but the investigators that I, I have talked to, they say, you know, if this is not uh, unlike a, a drug ring investigation. And you know, when you are going after a drug kingpin, you don't start off by charging the drug kingpin. You start off by charging the street dealers and, and you arrest them. And the difference is that when they get snared, you know, they get released back in so they can, you know, wear wires and be snitches. Uh, in this case, uh, it's known who's arrested. It's publicized, but uh, one, of, one of the people that has been arrested so far has cut a plea deal and has agreed to fully cooperate with investigators. And so they're working their way up the ladder and the, the investigations are, are not over yet. Uh, the reason the governor has not been charged, part of it is that, you know, he had kind of a firewall around him. He had his inner circle who were getting and receiving emails on this, but so far there has not been anything that directly links the, the governor to this. But although, uh, you know, Michigan is interesting. It's one of only two states where the uh, governor and the state legislature are not subject to Freedom of Information Act request. Although that's one thing that's changing. There's now legislation moving through the legislature that, that's trying to change that as a result of Flint. But as a result of the public pressure, the, the governor has been releasing uh, emails from his office and from all state agencies. And there was one email, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there was one email that I thought was uh, particularly instructive, which was that uh, under emergency management, the state instituted uh, state police bike patrols in the city of Flint. And the, and the governor himself was exchanging emails with officials in Flint saying, how are those bike patrols working out? And what's the public perception of those bike patrols? And so you have a governor that was so hands-on that he has taken a, a direct interest in how well state police bike patrols are working in Flint, but yet expects people to believe that it was not until October of 2015 that it came to his attention that there was this problem with Flint's water. You know, uh, so we'll, we'll find out if uh, he was really that ignorant of the situation as the investigations uh, continue to go forward and how high up it, it eventually leads. And a quick local note here, uh, Washington has a very expansive Public Records Act, but the legislature is exempt. Washington has a very, very expansive Public Records Act, uh, but the legislature is exempt from the Public Rec Records Act in Washington. Uh, because they make the laws, right? And so it's like, oh, it's okay for everybody else, but uh, we don't want anybody really knowing too much about what's going on behind the scenes regarding what we're doing. Uh, another question here, why did the EPA collude with Snyder? If, if that's correct, if that's your analysis of the situation? Well, Miguel del Toro definitely didn't collude. He tried to find out the, the, the truth about what was going on and, and was lied to. Uh, but when he leaked that memo to Leanne Walters and talked to me, he got slapped down. Uh, and the EPA, I don't know that it's right to say exactly that they colluded, but they definitely did not do their job. They, they absolutely... Someone at EPA did lose their job over this, right? Yes, the, the, uh, the regional director of, of uh, Region 5 in Chicago uh, resigned under pressure uh, because of her handling of, of this situation. Uh, but, you know, you, you hear the phrase, you know, heads need to roll over this. And when, you know, people resign, uh, they say, oh, you know, that's considered one of the, the heads that rolled. Well, as far as I'm concerned, you know, resigning from your job for something like this is, is not a head roll. You know, going to, going to prison over something like this, that's, that might be a, a head roll. But just quitting and getting your pension uh, is, is not really a, an adequate uh, price to pay for 
lead poisoning a, a town. Another question. Seattle is about to publish its annual water quality report. How much can we rely on these reports? Uh, the questioner says, I personally have seen significant differences between this report and the analysis done by impartial consumer advocacy groups. Well, I think that you need to contact uh, your local media and ask them to step up and do their job and ask them to FOIA uh, the homes that are being tested, ask them to FOIA the documentation that proves that the homes that are being tested are high-risk homes, ask them to uh, FOIA the protocols that are being used to see if they're doing, uh, what, what they were doing in Flint, what they've been doing in other places is something called uh, pre-flushing, which the uh, EPA protocol for testing says that water has to remain stagnant for a minimum of uh, six hours and there's no upper limit on how long that water can sit there stagnant before it is sampled. So if, if you've run the water any time in the previous six hours, that does not meet the protocol. Correct, but what, what people in, in Michigan were being instructed was that before you let it sit stagnant for six hours, run it for five minutes. That gets the, all the water out of your system and brings in the, the freshest, uh, cleanest water from the water main. And then they would say, and it, and it shouldn't sit for more than eight hours. So they created this, the, the most narrow window possible of six to eight hours in which they would test. If you didn't pre-flush and you went away for the weekend, it, it could be sitting there for you know 48 hours or more. That's, that's totally legitimate to test that, and that's real world conditions. You know, you go away from the, the weekend and you, you come back and the first thing you do is you make a pot of coffee or something, right? Uh, so that's the real world conditions. You're being exposed to whatever amount of lead is in your water after it's been sitting there for days or, or even longer. Uh, what they were doing was creating this, this artificial, most narrow window possible by pre-flushing on the front end and put in an upper limit of eight or, or 12 hours on, on the back end as a, as a way of you know, guaranteeing, that, uh, minimizing the, the amount of lead that's gonna be detected when you, when you test for it. So really, if you want to have uh, security about the, the job that's being done, uh, you really need to demand your local media step up and ask for the, the protocols, the testing protocols, ask them for the records uh, that, because what the, they need to verify that the homes that they're testing are high risk. So how did they verify? How do they know that there's a lead service line in those homes that they're testing? How do they know that there's lead plumbing in those homes that they're testing? If they can't provide those documentations, that documentation, then uh, you need to be concerned about the results that they're producing. And I, I don't know the answer to this, something as a reporter to look into. When the Seattle does that water quality report, I'm not sure that's a test of water quality that comes out of your faucet. I think that's the test of water quality that they send to your faucet, mm -hmm. you know, which is you know, really great water when it leaves them, but then when it gets to you, that's the question, right? Well, the, there's different kinds of water tests, and, and definitely what they test more frequently is, is the quality of the water as it's leaving the, the water treatment plant. Uh, but they are required to periodically do lead tests. And, and so, you know, that, that information is, is out there and the, the protocols for doing that testing is publicly available information. But I mean, what they were doing in Flint, they kept saying, every time that we tested the, the water for lead, it came back, you know, no detect. And that, but that was the water as it was coming out of the water plant. That's not where the problem was, as, as Mark Edwards said. The problem is when that corrosive water sits in those lead service lines, and is it being treated adequately to prevent those lead particles from leaching into the water and eventually getting into, uh, into people? A couple of questions from, from the other perspective. Uh, did the emergency manager have a choice? Was there really any 
money for a city that has no money? You know, did, they, did the emergency manager really have a choice here? Well, the choice is what's more important, you know. Uh, giving people water uh, that you wouldn't give to an animal or, you know, missing bond payments, right? You know, so you go bankrupt. I mean, that, that, that was a choice. Under the emergency manager law, they could say this city is bankrupt and that, you know, the bondholders or actually the bond insurers, right, who are in the business of taking a risk, you know, they, they could have gone to court and said, you know, we're broke. We, we borrowed this money and we just cannot pay it back. And what money we do have, we need to make sure that there are enough firefighters and enough police officers and the water is, is clean and, and, and safe to drink. So there were other options available, but those options were not pursued. Well, when it came to the bondholders, were they trying to protect the state of Michigan's credit, not just Flint's credit? Yes, absolutely. And because those emergency managers work really for the state of Michigan, they wanted to protect the state's credit above the safety of the people of Flint. Yes, absolutely. But one of the things that happened that put these cities that were teetering on the, on the edge of uh, you know, financial catastrophe was that the governor came into office and gave a massive tax break to Michigan corporations. And in order to help fund that tax break, made massive cuts into revenue sharing going to cities. So one of the reasons that they were not able to uh, provide clean, safe water was the millions of dollars in revenue sharing. So what, what essentially what they did was the state created, or well, there's a lot of reasons for their financial problems, but certainly they, they pushed it over the edge by cutting the revenue sharing to the cities. And then the result of that was, well, look at what bad shape you're in financially to justify taking them over. So they, they helped create the crisis and then use the crisis that they helped create as a justification for taking over these cities. And then one of the things that they do when they take over the cities is they sell off their assets. One of the things that they sold off in Flint was the water pipe that connected to the Detroit system. And, and, and so when they had who, who to- Who bought that? Uh, the Genesee County bought it. Uh, and so when they had to reconnect with the Detroit system, they had to rent the water pipe that they used to own. You know, that's, that's how like ludicrous all this is. And, but they, so they're, they're, they're like stripping these cities of their assets and not really solving the structural problems. So there's gonna be even less there to help sustain these cities. One of the cities, uh, Benton Harbor on Lake Michigan had a, a beautiful, beautiful public park. And, you know, poor people don't have a lot, but when you have a beautiful park to go to to spend your, your weekends at, you know, that, that uplifts your life. It helps make life livable. The emergency manager sold it to a private interest that turned it into an exclusive country club. You know, so, so poor people could no longer benefit it from it, but rich people could go there and play golf and, you know, hang out and drink their cocktails and look out over, over Lake Michigan. Because, you know, because poor people don't really deserve anything nice. You know, if you want nice things, well, get out there and work. Uh, and if there's no jobs for you, well, tough luck. Well, in light of what you told us in the last five minutes, this question seems a little out of place, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Our questioner says, most people are well-intentioned and most people do what they are incentivized to do. What were the incentives in the various organizations that led to such bad choices? The incentives were, A, on the part of the emergency manager to balance the budget at any cost. 
One of the problems with the emergency manager law is that it takes away checks and balances that are inherent and crucial to a democracy. So under a normal situation, you would have the city of Flint as an independent entity conducting these water tests. And then you would have the state of Michigan as an independent entity overseeing it to make sure that those tests were being properly conducted. But here you had a situation where you had an appointee of the governor who made this disastrous decision to use this corrosive water being overseen by a state agency that has, is run by an appointee of the governor. So everybody was on the same team. There, there, was, there was no you know, independent factions keeping an eye on each other. Uh, they were all part of the same team. And the incentive was to keep your job, right? People, people turned a blind eye to it. Even the guy at the water department who said, if you switch over, it's gonna be over my objections. He didn't go to the local media and say, look at a terrible mistake is about to happen. They're gonna start using the Flint water treatment plant and it's not ready to be used. People need to know about this. You know, he didn't do that. He kept his mouth shut and went along with it and contributed to the lead poisoning of a, a, his town in order to just keep his job. That's what the incentive is. We're, we're a little over time. I'm, I'm gonna sort of reshape a final question here, uh, a thought that comes from one of, one of our questioners. Uh, your story is a story, the story you're telling is the story of a city that lost its democracy. What do we need to do to keep our democracy? You have to be engaged in it. You know, I often think, Man, if, if, if people spent one-tenth of, of the time uh, that they spend paying attention to sports teams, you know, you can talk to people and they can tell you, you know, everybody's batting average and, and you know, everything that's going on with the, the, the line of the, the Seahawks and, and how things are going with the, the defensive backfield or whatever. And I thought you were going to bash the Kardashians. <laughs> You know, if, democracy is, is not a spectator sport. Democracy is a participatory thing. And I, I think the, the fact that all you who are here tonight understand that and uh, are engaged. But for we're paying a consequence of people not being engaged. You know, paying consequences of people who, you know, take their news from some source and don't go any deeper than that. Uh, paying the consequences of not demanding more of your media and, and supporting media that does good work. You know, the, the other lesson and take away from this is the importance of investigative reporting. You know, the, the founding fathers uh, wrote, yeah. You know, the, the founding fathers uh, put freedom of the press in the, in the First Amendment for a reason because that, that's the, the other leg that makes democracy work, knowing that a free independent press is, is there to hold government accountable. But, you know, people need to support news organizations or, as it is now, nonprofits that are doing good investigative work. And, and so if, if you want democracy to work, you have to work at it. Kurt Guyette, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.